Did you know it can be difficult to prove your race? Recently, when one of my relatives died, his family sent a notice to the media, along with his picture. He had been a prominent member of the community, and the notice read, Aldrich Tootie Dupree was the first black person elected to the Iberville Parish Police Jury. Some members of the media called the family to tell them they had sent the wrong picture, that the picture they sent was that of a white man. To which his daughter replied, no, it's the right picture. That's my father. If we're going to deal in color in this country, shouldn't we have a sure way of knowing which color group a person belongs to? <laughs> the reason we don't is because race isn't real. It's a social concept. But racism is real, and it needs to end. There's a statement I've heard all my life, and that is, we can never and racism, but we can. Before we get further, I want to point out an important distinction. I'm not talking about individual prejudice. I'm talking about the power given to institutions to enforce that prejudice. That's what I'm talking about ending. This was built into our country, a system of laws and policies and practices that allowed institutions to set aside services and resources for whites only. That's racism. So we built this race structure, and now we say we can never dismantle it? That Americans who were not born white will continue to find color barriers? This is America. What kind of first world country are we if we can't end a system we created? We have the resources. We have the technology. Do we have the will? I've spent a lot of time in my life thinking about race. And here in Baton Rouge in recent years, people have been coming together to teach each other how to talk about it. One of the problems we have around race in America is we don't talk about it. Somehow we've been taught that it's not polite to talk about race. But it is. It's important and healthy to talk about any issue in America openly and honestly, and to create a safe space to have an open and honest conversation around race is vital because that talk creates action. There are those who say, why are we still talking about race? Didn't race discrimination end with the civil rights movement? Aren't things better now? Things are better now. We no longer have signs that say white only or colored. Black people can vote and attend public schools and universities that used to be all white. They can sit in any vacant seat they want on public transportation. These and many other public choices, once closed to people of color, are now open. These changes came about after the Civil Rights Amendment made race discrimination illegal. But here we are in the 21st century, and racism is still being practiced, even though it's against the law. That's why we're still talking about it. If you break a traffic law, you get a ticket. And why do you get a ticket? because there's someone watching with the authority to enforce that law. With race discrimination, there's no one watching and no enforcement. Sure, if you believe you've been discriminated against because of your color, you have a right to file a lawsuit. But people of color face race discrimination daily. And if they file lawsuits every time they encounter a color barrier, the courts would be chock full of such cases. Today, race discrimination is practiced in more subtle ways such as African-Americans calling ahead about an advertised vacancy only to show up and be told the space is no longer available. Areas with large populations of people of color often find their voting power diluted because of gerrymandering or the redrawing of representative district lines. So race discrimination at the Civil Rights Amendment didn't set policies and didn't set standards and guidelines for institutions to follow. So there's no monitoring to determine when actual discrimination has occurred and no sanctions. To be white in America is to have an all-access pass. To have, be of color is to have your access limited, unless they can't tell what color group you belong to. A woman I know, who looks white, owns property in a predominantly white area near New Orleans. She moved there 
from Chicago, not knowing the community's reputation for being racist. After Katrina, she wanted to go in and inspect her property, but she had heard that damaged areas were being carefully guarded and that people of color were being denied entry. In order to avoid being turned away, she said to her husband, who does not look white, that it would be best to let her do the talking. She simply told the guards she wanted to go in and see the condition of her home. As her husband tells it, he played the role of Hulk, as in the movie Driving Miss Daisy. A social construct that groups its citizens by color and ranks them from superior to inferior needs to be more than illegal. It needs to be dismantled. We often say we want to get beyond race, but how do we do that? Supreme Court Justice Harry Blackman wrote, to get beyond racism, we must first take account of race. There's no other way. How about asking, what is it about color that makes a person not eligible for full American rights and privileges? And if people should have these rights, and color discrimination is still being practiced, should we let that go on? It is all our responsibility to determine what kind of country we want. We didn't choose to be in an unequal society, but we've all inherited it. A young white man asked me recently how racism affects him. I said, do you lock your doors when you drive through a neighborhood with black people? He said, yes. Now, why would a young white man driving through a neighborhood with black people have an automatic knee-jerk reaction when he knows nothing else about the area? I said, that's how race affects you. Many Americans truly disapprove of racism and want it to end, but they fear that that will never happen. That fear reminds me of this story. I was talking to a 91-year-old man some years back, and he was telling me about being around before there were automobiles. I said, what did you say when they told you there were going to be automobiles? He said, I said, no such a thing. There ain't never going to be anything that can go down the road without a horse pulling it. His response was understandable. There had never been anything like it before. But like with the invention of the automobile, there are many institutional actions that have completely changed our system. Many people never thought we would see smoke-free public places. Not only are they smoke-free, but most people have completely accepted it, including people who smoke. And who in the early 80s thought we would see the Berlin Wall come down? That wall, that action, ended the Cold War. It was people that built that wall and people that tore it down. We've already begun the job of dismantling racism by taking down signs like those that say white only. Those who worked in the civil rights movement are proud to say they were a part of it. What would you like to say about the role you played in ending racism? Abraham Lincoln said, this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom. And that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. It's in America's DNA to persevere. Together, as Americans, we can end racism.